can, but I'm going to. All right, can you, can you see my screen all right? Yep, great. Awesome. So I'll go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for attending my lecture. I'm glad to be here. Wish I could be there in person. Wasn't able to work that out. I actually asked, but it just wasn't wasn't in the cards right now to, to come out there. But um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about myself and Lake Flato and, and specifically about culture and design technology. So I'll get into all that in a minute, but um, I always like to start presentations with this slide. It's actually our entire firm's three-day weekend, long weekend getaway at Ted Flato's Ranch in West Texas, where we go there and and camp and swim and eat and drink and dance. And then we do all that over again um, for three full days and we don't talk about work. There's no team building activities. It's just a really fun thing to do as a as a group, um, which is a, a is one of the things that cultivates the culture at Lake Flato. Um, all right, so a quick introduction to myself. My my name is Dan Stein. I'm the director of design technology at Lake Flato, and I also lead our research program. And I'm also in our design performance group. Uh, I have taught uh, graduate architecture students at NDSU for 10 years, and a couple of years I've also taught the interior design students, and I've presented at the University of Minnesota many times uh, when a Professor or Dean Asajo was there um, for, for her students. Uh, I'm the author of 19 textbooks, uh, most of the books that you see over my um, my right shoulder there are books that I've written. One of them is the number one Revit book in North America. I've written two books that are on architectural hand sketching. That One of them has a sketch from the late Cesar Pelli in it. Um, I'm the co-author of this document that the AIA, the American Institute of Architects, commissioned Lake Flato and Bureau Happold to write. There are six of us that wrote this document called the AIA Climate Action Business Playbook. And then I also um, do a fair amount of blogging. I have a blog called BIM Chapters, where I write about uh, building information modeling and design performance. Uh, I'm also commissioned by Enscape, usually once a month, to write a blog post for them. Uh, in fact, one was just published today that, that I wrote. Um, and then there's a Lake Flato blog called The Dog Run. And then I'm on two committees, um, the IES uh, BIM Standards Committee I'm the chair of, and um, Dean Asajo is also on that committee with, with me. And then I'm on the National AIA Committee on the Environment Leadership Group. There's 12 of us at the national level that oversee all things COAT. Hopefully you've heard of, for example, COAT Top 10 Student Award. Um, if you haven't, I highly recommend that um, that you take a look at that and consider entering that award. And uh, speaking of my role as director of design technology, it's it's not super common. It's becoming more common. It's it's different than uh, what you might be more familiar with. You might have heard the term BIM manager. Uh, but I oversee a lot of things in the firm and touch lots of areas of the firm. In fact, this gold area, which is sort of the definition of my role, is, is really um, technically much uh, broader than what's even shown there. Um, but I'm going to keep moving. I have lots of slides to go through. So I want to just spend a minute talking about Lake Flato. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of the firm before, but obviously after this presentation, you'll be able to say you've heard of Lake Plato. Um, we're small, but we've done a lot of really cool things, lots of great accomplishments. About half of our work is national. And uh, right now we have a project 
kind of close to you, to you all um, at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, we have a couple of projects at Cornell and projects in Fiji and Hawaii and the Caribbean, California, and some uh, mountains in Montana. So there's 150 people at Lake Flato, and we have our primary office is in San Antonio, and we also have a, a smaller office in Austin, Texas. Um, in uh, 20, 2004, the firm was the AIA firm of the year nationally, and, and that was at our 20th anniversary. This year marks the firm's 40th anniversary, and um, in an interesting sort of cadence, uh, the, our two founders, David Lake and Ted Flato, um, just won the 2024 AIA Gold Medal Award, which is the highest award that any individual architect can win um, in the U.S. And in 2019, Architect Magazine ranked us the number one firm in the United States. We have five studios, residential, learning, higher ed, urban development, and then the bottom center, the, sort of the funnest one to say, eco-conservation studio. Um, so that studio does a lot of projects that integrate with nature. In fact, all of our projects strive to do that. Um, but that one's sort of focused on sus high sustainability goals. And uh, we just recently completed a passive house design and about to be certified environmental learning center uh, just north of Chicago. And we have a project at the Houston Zoo and then they also do botanical gardens. Um, and as I mentioned, there are a couple of higher ed projects I already had alluded to. Um, we've also won, I mentioned the, the Coat Top 10 Student Awards. There's a professional version of this award that um, has been in the, in the works for several years now. And Lake Flato has won more of those awards than any other firm over the years. So we've won 15 AIA COAT, C-O-T-E, stands for Committee on the Environment, top 10 awards. And interestingly enough, the, there's just a, a pretty wide variety of project types um, of our projects that have won. Uh, in the lower left is a grocery store that won this award, H-E-B, which is a giant grocery store in South Texas with 100,000 employees. Um, in the upper left is a project near Dallas, um, Josie Pavilion, that was one of the, it was the first living building challenge in Texas. I think it was at the time like eighth, seventh or eighth in the world. And then the kind of in the lower right, there's a project called the World Birding Center that I, I think is close to 15, 18 years old. And it uh, has some really interesting attributes. It, it was uh, pretty um, ahead of its time. For some of the things that were done on the project, and if you go read the the description of the Coat Top Ten Award for that project, you'll you'll pick up on some of this. It was designed for deconstruction, and it was also um, designed for low embodied energy. We usually use the phrase low embodied carbon now, but um, as those are some of the things Lake Plato was thinking about 15, 18 years ago. Um, so I want to show you a bunch of photographs first. When it comes to firm culture, sometimes it's hard to describe and to show a, a graph or some sort of architectural project. And, and really, culture is more about the people, right, than, than the process or, or the, the final architecture in a lot of ways. And to that point... I'm going to be speaking at the AIA National Conference with two other architecture firms that are high-performing, um, award-winning, sustainable design firms. And the title of our presentation is Culture Eats Strategy for Breakfast. So kind of a fun title, but um, it's true. If, if you don't have a good firm culture, you're not really set up to have success in, in different aspects of a architectural practice. Um, so firm culture, cultivated for success. Um, these are a bunch of photos. And one of them, you might be surprised. I don't know. I have my chat open. So 
if any of you have questions or comments, I highly recommend you just throw them in there and, and let's make this kind of fun and semi-informal if possible. If not, I can talk for a full hour, no problem. But um, I'm curious if any of you have ever been to San Antonio, Texas. It has the most amazing several mile meandering river one level below the street throughout the entire city. You can see the blue river on the on the left. And here's an example of it on the right. It's just something when I came for my like day long interview in January of 2020, I never imagined to, to see this in, in South Texas. Um, so it's a really beautiful city. It's in fact, the seventh largest city in the United States. So these are all photographs that I've taken over time. Um, it has uh, essentially some ruins. There's these missions, the Alamo being the most famous one. That's actually only, um, yeah, oh, I'm going to go back two slides here real quick. Um, green area, if, I don't know if you can see my cursor, hopefully you can, is the Alamo. And then this little red arrow is pointing at Lake Flato's office downtown San Antonio, but seventh largest city in the United States. Um, the Alamo um, and, and the other missions were built in the early 1700s. Um, and a couple of them are still active Catholic churches, but all of them are, you can tour them and see some pretty interesting architecture. Um, so that's about the place. Uh, one other thing quickly about the place, I don't think I have a uh, area to talk about this later, but San Antonio is the largest city in the U.S. with a deconstruction ordinance. In 2022, the city council voted to ban demolition of one to four family homes. Um, so if you do want to remove a house to build something new, for example, um, you have to uh, have a, a certified deconstruction contractor come and take the building apart, sort of reverse building it, if you're not familiar with that idea, and all of the um, salvageable materials, which includes the wood studs, the window sashes, even the counterweights, um, doors and trim, all of that uh, goes into the circular economy locally. And um, uh, low income households, which most likely are to have a, a similar aged home that they wanna fix up and not tear down, can get all of these materials to repair and improve their homes for free. In fact, the city also has um, just like a book library where you can check out books for free and return them. They have a professional grade tool library where you can check out sawzalls and other, you know, um, hammer drills and things like that and, and fix your house. And so trying to preserve and extend the life of a lot of these amazing uh, structures that are rich in culture. Um, so now I'm going to switch to things just happening in the firm that really go speak to the culture that's cultivated in the firm. We have a monthly presentation that we call the Sustainability Champions presentation, and th there's uh, breakfast tacos included, which is kind of fun. I didn't also know that was a thing until I moved to, to San Antonio, the Tex-Mex capital of, of the the world really. Um, and so here's a pre, we often have a guest presenter, just like I'm presenting to you remotely. Oftentimes the presenter is, is remote, um, but here's an example of um, uh, Adele Hout Houghton uh, from Houston who actually drove over to present live. And she, actually, she has a, a PhD in public health from Harvard and a master's in architecture degree from Princeton. And she was presenting on this um, uh, architectural epidemiology playbook that she developed that seeks to align project goals and certifications with actual community needs rather than uh, oftentimes just coming up with a, a goal that is probably you know not bad, but maybe not exactly what the community needs. So that's um, a really cool. And then a, a really keen, poignant, part about the culture that's cultivated in the firm is while we have somebody really important, arguably, right, like this uh, about to present, um, they actually get to stand by for, for about 
12 minutes roughly while we have uh, a junior or um, less experienced staff member often is is the case get to present something that they've worked on that that's just really cool like they did an energy model or a daylight analysis on a project and we uh, basically they get the opportunity to show off some some fun stuff that they did and and then it shares the knowledge is sort of disseminating opportunities so that people can go talk to them if they want to know how to do it um, we have this thing where we support local artists um, once a year. So every 12 months, we um, curate art from one or a group of local artists. And we just recently swapped out the art that basically at the beginning of the year, it turns over. And um, and so we had on the left, the, the picture on the left in the upper right was a, we invited the artists in for a lunch. And you can see on the computer screen or the on the wall there, art plus LF, LF is Lake Flato market lunch. So out the window in, in the courtyard, and then also in the lower right, you can see that every every Wednesday year round, because it's, it's really nice here, it doesn't snow. <laughs> um, we have a farmer's market where staff can buy fruits and vegetables to bring home. Um, uh, uh, actually the parents of one of our intern, well, um, sort of an architect in training. Uh, I don't think he's registered, but his parents do this farmer's market. And and so one day out of the week where they do this farmer's market somewhere else, they come here and set up shop. And then every Wednesday during that farmer's market, we buy some of the produce um, and then um, cook a protein. And then there's four or five people you, uh, you'll see on the next slide that actually prepare the food. Um, it rotates on who does the preparation. Those people who do the preparation get to eat for free. And then everybody else pays like $5 if they just want a salad or I think 7 or $8 if they want the salad plus whatever the protein is. But you can start to sense a lot of really interesting things that are going on. Here's the preparation for one of the um, market lunches. But that last one was pretty uh, just a sort of extra special one because we invited in the artists who have their artwork all over the office. And then we'll have another event where we invite, it's actually coming up in a week or two where we invite the um, public in to also see it. And another thing that happens during the summer, the next one's been, the first one of the year has actually just been scheduled where we have, um, it's called bike for breakfast. And uh, everybody, it's encouraging everybody to bike to work, but also people who just bike by our office to a downtown job location, we'll happily have them come in and we have this uh, bunch of breakfast prepared and it's a little bit hard to see, but on the right, you can see there's a little tent set up and a local bike company uh, comes in and does free tune-ups, but they also have some, the, the trade-off is they get to show off some new bikes that are for sale if anybody's interested. Um, and then I only have a couple of extra slides here, but here's some, uh, our intern program is really interesting in that uh, there's a, a couple of architects who are, I would say, mid-level architects. So they're not um, like senior people. They're they're a little bit closer, you know, and can relate and connect to the interns that are working in the office. They actually um, organize these activities where they'll go out to uh, Big uh, Big Bend, and it's a um, it's a state park in, in Texas that's pretty rugged and beautiful, sort of like the Grand Canyon a little bit. Um, and so here's like an outing. Um, we get together for lunch a lot. There's me in the in the front, uh, just a couple blocks from our office. And then we have these pinup projects all over the office. In the upper left, you'll see the, the Penn State, uh, or I'm sorry, the University of Pennsylvania project. Um, we are also doing something with Penn State. We've submitted some grants uh, related to some of the invest the research stuff that I'm involved with. Um, and then another research result we recently uh, completed and are presenting to each of the studios that meet once a week is on climate futures and how the weather is changing and how we need to use data that's um, projected forward rather than looking back at historical data like weather weather data for example 
And then uh, this is actually a visit to a deconstruction project site. So I guess I could have talked about that here. Um, the lady on the right is from this uh, woman owned um, deconstruction contractor trainer. They actually come from Savannah, Georgia and the city of San Antonio. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They, um, they help offset the costs for a local contractor who wants to get certified to become a deconstruction contractor. Um, so I'm on the left there. And then the two folks in the middle are actually interns that came with me to a project site to see this uh, house being deconstructed. Uh, and then when we get to the end, you'll see actually uh, our own office. We did some deconstruction when we recently remodeled it. But I uh, here's an opportunity where, again, just sharing knowledge and particularly locally uh, is really great. This is a University of Texas, San Antonio. And these are all architecture students that saw me present. And you can see my typical starting slide on the screen there. Uh, and then we also go to career fairs. So this is um, Texas Prairie View, uh, Texas A&M Prairie View, uh, just outside of Houston. And um, they actually built this, they, the professor here, um, Dr. Um, I can't remember her name. Um, she has she does a lot with um, like climate justice and then also just uh, resiliency. So they actually designed this structure here that's meant to um, help offset areas that have been uh, devastated by hurricanes, which happen you know fairly frequently in the Houston area. And um, I helped uh, by doing some presentations for the students on energy modeling and then reviewing the work that the students did. So that's a quick uh, kind of picture book of firm culture at Lake Plato, which I think is really fun. It's a fun way to show and, and really kind of impress upon you all the kind of interesting things that can go on in a firm. Um, and so definitely something to think about when you're going to look for a job, right, is find out if firms do these kind of things to, you know, make it a fun place to work, which, um, you know, is good on multiple levels. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about design performance before I focus more specifically on design technology. So as I mentioned, we are an award-winning firm. We've won the most of the AIA Coat Top 10 awards, which is the highest sustainability award that firms can win. We've won a lot of national and state awards across the country, state awards. Uh, but all of that doesn't happen by accident. And um, you might be able to deduce that by the number of awards and accolades the firm has, but it's helpful to point it out. And one of the ways in which it's organized for success is our design performance group that I'm on. It's a group of five people that are dedicated full time to design performance. I actually, I'm the only one who's sort of not a hundred percent full time, but I'm still up fully overhead, not working on projects, which I guess is the main point. Five people who aren't um, fully billable on projects that are focused on design performance in a hundred and fifty person firm. It's a pretty good size. Uh, group for that site for our size firm. Um, and so we have a director of design performance, Heather Holdridge, and she actually has a, uh, she's trained as a mechanical engineer, the only person in our firm that is everybody in our firms, either an architect or an interior designer. And then um, our design performance manager actually meets once a month with a representative from each of those studios that I mentioned earlier. And it's a way of making sure that projects goals stay on track and then also to disseminate information. And in fact, both ways, not just um, top down, so to speak, but uh, the studio champions are also really interested in sustainability and they, they learn new things and new tools and hear about things. And so it's a great way of sharing information but then within each studio, each one of these little four circles is meant to represent a project. And each project has a designated sustainability champion. Oftentimes, um, well, not oftentimes, but if the studio champions on a project, they're typically also the person who's the sustainability champion on that project. 
but then other projects will have at least one person who's designated as a sustainability champion. And so the studio champion works with the their champions within the project groups um, to just to make sure things stay on track. That's the biggest challenge is making sure things stay on track. And um, this is a snapshot of just what the design performance group actually does. Like early on in the climate or in the concept stage, we're, we're pulling up microclimate data. We are still looking at historical data like wind roses and and average temperatures. Um, we're, we're getting involved in and often lead this thing called the integrated design workshop. I got another slide on that in, in just a moment. So I'll come back to that. And then we're doing performance, like design performance analysis, like energy modeling, daylighting analysis, um, embodied carbon analysis. And then oftentimes when we can, if the client's game for it, um, we'll do post-occupancy evaluation, which is where we try and get uh, either sensors that are in the building or at the very least taking the utility bills and, and deducing how much energy the building is actually using and compare that to the design that we did. It's a great way to for lessons learned for future projects, but also to find problems. If there's um, something that's not working properly, we, we can oftentimes figure out what that is. And, and uh, if they didn't do this, you know, they might have a pump or a PV panel that where its inverter was just, you know, bad from the get go. Um, we can get that optimized and save a lot of money. Um, another thing that we do related to the AIA is actually um, the 2030 commitment. So there's something called architecture 2030 that's not part of the AIA that was designed to um, promote a goal of getting to net zero um, carbon by the year 2030. And with uh, every so many years, the the goal towards that ratchets, ratchets up. So right now we're at 80% um, uh, reduction from the baseline. And then once we get to 2030, it should be a hundred percent, meaning that we're not, we're, we're, we have optimized buildings that use the lowest possible energy. And then we have renewable energy like PV panels or wind, something like that to offset it, um, to make uh, zero carbon buildings that are not emitting carbon into the environment. And so the, the uh, gray is the, AIA, they, they created this program called the 2030 Commitment, and firms that sign up obligate themselves to doing energy modeling on all their projects or reporting them as a code minimum and, and then reporting their entire portfolio. And it's it's anonymous like in the sense that the AIA isn't sharing like the actual results of Lake Flato, but they're taking all the results and creating these gray bars, which you can see as an industry, both the industry and Lake Flato are falling short of these goals. These bars should go all the way up to that goal. 100% would be the project's net zero. And this is for the entire portfolio. So even though we often have a couple of net zero projects, we also have projects that aren't performing as well. So that averages out um, to be what you see here. And so you might ask, well, why would we share this? It makes us look bad, <laughs> but we're, we we continue to push ourselves to to do better and and also to promote this industry wide initiative. Um, so yeah, and and then again, related to being organized, we have these workflows for operational energy. So this is like the amount of electricity or gas we're trying to use less and less fossil fuels. But um, the energy that's consumed can be modeled based on the, the size of the building and the amount of windows and the R value of the walls and the roof. And so we try to do that as early as possible so that we can still make meaningful changes to the design. And, um, and then all the way through to, again, post-occupancy evaluation, which is, if possible, again, we like to... Um, actually see if the building is performing as we intended. 
And then parallel to this, um, we're trying to do this more and more. We don't do this on every project yet, but we do a life cycle assessment, which is uh, looking at embodied carbon. So the amount of energy that's used to extract mat raw materials out of the ground, the energy to make an object like, you know, so it, there's iron ore being extracted out of the ground takes energy. And then turning that into a steel beam, a wide flange beam or column also takes energy. And then shipping that to the project site takes energy. So we try to capture all of that and figure out what we can do on a project to reduce the amount of embodied carbon. One of those things is to use mass timber for the structure like we're doing at UPenn. In fact, that, that project at UPenn is the first mass timber building in Philly um, and it's under construction right now. So, um, and then wood also sequesters carbon. So there's a lot more that could be said about all that, but that's just a quick snapshot of, here's a process that we have and we can do it in a couple of ways, like the whole building or design options where we're just looking at a material on, on the skin of the building to see what what's the best material, brick versus um, terracotta versus wood siding, cement board. Um, we also have a thing called a design performance action plan. So it's, it's our own um, sort of true north guide that basically we, we try to do everything as a firm based on the uh, two things. There's, there's basically a, a sort of what we think of as a prerequisite or a must do on every project. And then there's sort of some reach goals in each category. Like if, if we can, we want to do at least one of these things on a project to make the project better. And then we have our own little database databases and cheat sheets related to materials and the health of materials, you know, really bad materials can off gas and create really, really bad indoor air quality on projects. And then I, I alluded to this before, but another sort of, I like to call it a, you know, special sauce or secret sauce to our, you know, that relates to our success. There are other firms who do this, but we try to do it on every project and try to make it a really uh, significant one to two day three, uh, integrated design workshop where we get everybody together, the, the entire design team, which includes structural and MEP and civil and the client and the occupants and the building maintenance people, like every, and even sometimes the community, if it, if, uh, it, if it works out. And this is the ideal place before we've drawn a single thing. We've, we may have already looked up microclimate data and have some general site information, but uh, what are the goals and the strategies and the certifications that this project wants to go after? And then we create this report. And then during those monthly um, sustainability meetings that our design performance manager has, they, they look at that list and make sure that nobody forgets about some, some goal uh, before it, the design is too far along before you can change it. And so here's a little snapshot of the site analysis that we, we do on pretty much every project. And I'm just gonna keep going. Again, if anybody has any comments, just uh, throw them in the chat and I'll, I'll answer them. Or you could unmute yourself. I wouldn't be opposed to that either. Uh, but design technology, so as I mentioned, my title is Director of Design Technology, and and we try to um, have what we do in terms of software and how we use it highly optimized for success. And there's a lot of ways in which that is done. It, it starts with me vetting software, um, and then we when we implement it, we do training and try and have templates and then create workflows and and uh, ongoing training and support for everything so that we can do it in a really efficient way. We try not to have three rendering programs that all do the same thing. And there's just 5% of it or 10% of it that's different. In fact, at Lake Flato, we only use Enscape, for example. After that, it's Photoshop. <laughs> we don't use Lumion or Twinmotion. I mean, they all have their, their value, but we just standardize on one and try and do really, you know, Excel at it as much as possible. Um, so we have a Revit start screen that has a lot of 
sustainability information. This is this is our Revit start screen. Everybody who starts Revit sees this thing. Um, these are just a snapshot of some of the tools we use. There's obviously a lot more, but these are a lot of the big ones. Uh, we do a lot of um, immersive environment type things. So on the right actually is one of our partners, uh, uh, Joe Ben, who is leading a, a, um, an addition and remodel of the San Antonio airport. So you remember it's the seventh largest city in the US and we have the a project we're working on in conjunction with Corgan to effectively double the size of the airport. And so just last week, I was with Joe at the airport, and we were delivering virtual reality to the airport team, and they absolutely loved it. In the upper left is a, a picture of a dedicated VR space with our office. And um, here are uh, some students that were touring our office. And then we do a lot of energy modeling, like I mentioned, using Autodesk Insight. Um, and another option within Revit that uses something called Open Studio and Energy Plus on your local computer. Um, this the the model that you see on the right is a project in the mountains in Montana. And in the live Revit model, we were able to do this detailed energy model. Uh, using Energy Plus, uh, when you install Revit, Energy Plus is automatically installed on on your computer. Um, and I'm just going to quickly go through this since we started a little bit late. Um, here's an example of an embodied carbon study that we we've I actually did myself for um, a boutique hotel in Austin, Texas, called Hotel Magdalena, and we're using this add-in for Revit called Tally that allows us to associate. That, that embodied carbon data with all the objects in the Revit model, you know, that uh, raw material extraction all the way to delivering it to the project site. And what was unique about this project is not only was, is it mass timber, but it also uses something instead of a CLT system, it uses a DLT system. So um, it's called dowel laminated timber and there's no glue in the system. There's actually dowels that are pounded through holes to hold the flooring and the shear walls together. Uh, and not having the glue reduces the global warming potential a, a significant amount. And um, so that project, Hotel Magdalena, along with the University of Pennsylvania project that I mentioned and, and two other projects are actually covered in this um, research white paper that we uh, published on our website. So if you go to Lake Flato's website and go to our investigations page, you'll see this embodied carbon white paper. And you can see all of this, all of this data on the left here about the reduction in global warming potential based on if that would have been a typical cast in place concrete project for a, a high quality hotel like this. And then um, we do a lot of daylight analysis uh, actually, I'm going to come back to daylight. I think that was a that slide was out of place. So here's uh, again using tally for embodied carbon. So that that previous example of the hotel was a a whole building analysis. This is an envelope analysis for a different project in Montana that we're working on, and we actually did this study of looking at a bunch of different insulation types. And then the, the bar charts for each one show the R value and the global warming potential. So we can look at all the, these different scenarios. You can see on the left, five and a half inch fiberglass, mineral wool, blown in cellulose, and then across the, the top, um, some other options. And so, uh, and this, this is the continuous insulation options across the top and then the cavity options on the left. And so, um, understanding that the material and the R value related to the global warming potential is really helpful. And then um, another thing that we do is we study the walls to figure out if there's any thermal bridging to make sure that there's um, not any sort of weak spots in the overall R value and any place that moisture might 
uh, collect. And then um, there's another interesting thing when we do uh, our daylighting analysis, this, this project is a, a middle school that we designed in Alamogordo, New Mexico. So super hot, super sunny location. And the company who makes this software, it's called Climate Studio. It's an add-in for Rhino. They wrote a blog post about Lake Flato and this particular project to highlight the fact that we we got our design performance team worked with with the design team in house early enough in the project when when you look at this row of classrooms here in the bottom center you can see that this corner classroom was just getting way too much sunlight and the design team actually through a couple of iterations made some significant changes to the design in fact that corner classroom now is really um slightly better than the original classrooms. And oftentimes these kind of analyses are done too late in the design process. And you've already shown the design to the client and they're they're like, what do you mean you wanna make big changes? Why didn't you do this earlier? <laughs> and it's a good question, why didn't you do this earlier? So we try to do this early enough so that meaningful changes can be made and we're not just checking a box to do daylighting and energy modeling, for example. Um, we use uh, some different online collaboration boards. We we still use Miro, but we're starting to switch to Zoom whiteboards, which are 95% as, as robust as Miro, it turns out. And everybody in our company has uh, Zoom. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna jump ahead because I know we're coming up on time here. So a couple of case studies, I mentioned we like to do post-occupancy evaluation, POE, as often as we can. And uh, just last year, one of this project I'm about to show you won a Coat Top 10 Award, Confluence Park. It's a park located here in San Antonio um, on, a, on a river. And basically we were able to install um, circuit level meters. So what that means is each breaker in the power panel has a circuit uh, or a meter attached to it. So we can tell uh, how much power each breaker, the, the stuff connected to each breaker is using. And through this, we were able to determine, for example, that um, the uh, HVAC system wasn't turning off when, when the windows Let's see, let me jump ahead. Uh, when these doors here for this classroom were opened, um, the HVAC system wasn't shutting off. So it was just draining a lot of energy. So we um, found out that the sensor wasn't working that should kick off the system when those doors open. And then another thing that happened, uh, let's see, uh, you can see on the roof, there's a, a bunch of PV panels and a week or two weeks after the project opened, um, some somebody jumped up on the roof and took these concrete blocks that hold down the PV panel and smashed all the PV panels out and, and vandalized them. So the insurance actually required that plexiglass be put on top of the PV panel. And about two years into the project, we realized um, through monitoring the energy creation and consumption that the panels weren't performing as they should. You can see this graph in the lower right and so we went out there with the client and found out that they were never cleaning these panels and some of them have been yellowed and cracked. And so they made the decision to replace all the plexiglass. And then since this is a public building that has public restrooms at this park, they put it on their cleaning list of things to do when they come to clean the toilet rooms um, to clean these plexiglass panels, which will help you know increase the, the power production that happens at the site. So a really beautiful project. We actually worked with um, uh, uh, a professor from Houston who specializes in uh, generative design to help create these um, uh, or organic pieces that actually collect the water as, as like a natural uh, leaf would and brings it into a drain and there's a hundred thousand gallon cistern under the ground that's used to water all the the plants and, and vegetation on the site. Uh, and so here's one, 
Two more quick case studies. I'm going to go through this one really fast. So the University of Pennsylvania, here's an Enscape rendering of the project. And fast forward to just a month or two ago, uh, a rendering of this project being built. So it's always kind of fun to compare. I mean, obviously there's pretty big differences, but still you get the sort of the essence of the project between the rendering and the actual project. So it's a mass timber building. There's this um, frit pattern on the glass. You can see that is actually um, decorative, but also has a ro role in reducing glare and solar heat gain to some degree. And we did an embodied carbon study on the project comparing steel versus mass timber and different envelope settings and, uh, and comparisons for embodied carbon. And so you can see again that there's a 50%, 55% reduction uh, when we look at the structure and enclosure of this building compared to a traditional building. And then the last case study is our own office that we just remodeled. Uh, we've been in it for a year now at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, once everybody was uh, working from home, we decided it was finally time to remodel the office that the firm had been wanting to remodel for a long time. And so we're trying to walk the walk and do some pretty aggressive things like um, get ILFI zero carbon certification as well as well building certification. Um, the project uh, has, it's a three-story building with an, a basement, which is somewhat unusual in, in San Antonio. Not, not a lot of basements down here because we don't really have frost or frost depth that we have to worry about. Um, but there was a one-story parking garage, um, and there's a garage door right here where you see this person standing. And there was about 18 to 22 cars that could park in there. And before the pandemic, the firm was growing and really successful. They were thinking about flooding that parking garage with desks and, and being able to accommodate the, the larger firm growth. Um, but with the pandemic coming along and the firm deciding to fully embrace the hybrid work scenario of people working part from home and part from the office, the day the office opened, we had less desks than people. So here's the parking garage. And of course, the firm could have made this look really great, right? I mean, you imagine this being filled with desks. It might not sound too impressive, but I'm sure it would have looked really nice. But instead, you know, I already mentioned that one of our um, sort of things that we do well is integrate buildings with the environment. We basically turn this into a courtyard that is available for our staff. And this is where the the market lunch or the farmer's market is, but this entire garage roof was actually deconstructed and all of the wood for this was captured and reused. This is called downcycling because you, when you take wood that was used for structure and use it for something decorative, it's it's not quite as the same. It could have been used for something structural, but we didn't, this is a remodel, so we didn't have any structure to use it for. So we used it aesthetically in the ceiling of the entire first floor. And then all of our phone rooms, the work surface in the phone rooms is wood from this garage, um, deconstructed wood as well. And so a lot of the materials have um, various certifications like EPDs or declare labels. And this carpet that we used is zero carbon certified. And then we also have offsite. It's still on our local power grid, but we have offsite um, power production that is it was done in a partnership with the local utility. And that is it. Um, happy to answer any questions. I know we're right at time too. So if anybody uh, needs to drop off, I, I totally understand. It's only 4 p.m. here in San Antonio in the central time zone. I know it's 5 p.m. for you. Um, I'll kick us off with questions. Um, you talked about working, great presentation, Dan. I'm always thrilled by the different types of projects and your technology that you always share with us, right? 
Um, you mentioned that you worked with a professor in Houston. I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit about the types of research or design projects that your firm has done with academia. Yeah, that's a great one. So the one with um, Andrew Cudless is the person, and he has a company called Mat Matsis. Um, we worked with him really kind of more in a professional capacity. He happens to be a professor, but that company of his is that that's a private company um, is is who we worked with. But a really great example of an academic partnership, if you were to go to um, AIA Japan, I don't know if you all knew that there was such a thing, but aiajapan.org slash Lake Plato, you can see this really great recording of a presentation we did back in July of 2022. And then last year, we also presented on this at the AIA National Conference um, we designed a, univer um, a university building at the University of Maryland, and it was designed with multiple biophilic design principles. So there's these principles of, of incorporating nature and water and creating areas of, of um, refuge and, and areas of um, uh, sort of danger. And, and so there's these bridges that are feel precarious to walk across, but then there's these alcoves that are sort of protective and there's a, some water features and some green walls. And it's all really um, apparent overtly uh, sustainable design features. And so Dr. Erin Hamilton, previously of Texas Tech, now she's at the um, UW Madison, um, she actually did a environmental occupant behavior study. So Lake Flato is not at all qualified to study people. <laughs> and that's where an academic partnership is really amazing. Um, she did uh, interviews and, and research and compared our building, uh, interviewing the faculty and the students to an adjacent, also fairly new building that was a lead gold building, but not overtly sustainably designed looking still a good quality building um, to kind of kind of understand and find out if people basically like spending more time in this building, if it motivates them to recycle more, um, to be more environmentally responsible. And, um, and the general result is that it does. And the paper is still actually, I was just corresponding with Dr. Hamilton recently last week. Um, she's, she's about to wrap, a, wrap this up in the next month or two. Um, so that's a, a really great example of uh, academic partnership. We also did a, a partnership with uh, uh, somebody who's now the Dean of Architecture at Kenshaw State in um, uh, Georgia. Uh, he, he used to work at UTSA, uh, Azim, I can't remember his last name now. Uh, and this was before my time actually, but he helped, He we worked with Lake Plato and, and him and UTSA to start our initial post-occupancy evaluation, like how do we monitor the energy that's being used in a building and track it and document it and compare it to, to something? Any other questions? I know Abby put one uh, uh, link in the chat. I'm going to put another one for our investigations. This is our research. We actually call it investigations rather than research because we're sort of knocking ourselves down a peg and not suggesting that we're doing the rigorous level research that's done in academia. Yes. Thank you, Carlos. Dan, I have a question. This is Sarah. Um, I am in landscape architecture. And um, I'm also the president of Maryland ASLA. And we are um, have this kind of fledgling um, climate action plan challenge for the for the students. Can you hear me? And I'm um, yes. wondering if you could go into a little more what the coat awards, like when they're just for our, our architecture students, um, when they are, um, like when submissions are due, it's what, what's involved. Um, you know, it's, it's changed a little bit um, recently. The The due dates have changed actually for students to align better with 
um, the academic schedule. Yeah. And, first, but then, first. Interestingly, the, the professional one just recently changed. It used to always be announced on Earth Day, and oh. now it's not going to be announced until conference. Um, so there's a little bit of a moving target. But here at the ACSA website, which is uh, done in association with the AIA, um, you can see the registration deadline. So this is 2023 stuff. Um, and I guess it says 20, let me go back to competitions here. This is helpful. I'm just wondering if it's something that landscape architecture students could submit um, projects to as well as architecture students. Oh, here we go. Uh, that's a that's a good question. I so the, most of this is based on the framework for design excellence. And um, they're, they're looking for students to have multiple um, uh, items in, in each of the 10 measures. So it's definitely heavily geared towards buildings, but I'm gonna double check on that and get back to you. I love the question. Um, and there's one, um, uh, another, I'm just blanking on last names now, but Robin, um, she used to be at the University of Maryland is now at Kenshaw State. Um, she is actually the, um, will be the chair next year of our leadership group. And she runs the subcommittee for um, the quote top 10 for students. Yes, Robin Paddock. Thanks, Carlos. Really, really batting zero there for last <laughs> names. Um, yeah, so I think that's an interesting question. Um, there's lots of really cool things happening in landscape architecture. My class at NDSU, North Dakota State University, is actually also open to landscape architects, even though it's heavily a building oh, um, uh, class. But I'm sure you're familiar with Pamela Conrad, who yep. has a tool for studying body carbon for landscape architecture. Yeah? Yep, yep. Um, well, this is helpful. I just, I didn't know. I mean, I'm sure my architecture colleagues know all about this, but I didn't know about it. And so it's, 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 it'd be interesting for us to look at um, as kind of a um, framework to bounce what we've done for our climate action plan challenge um, for students within the Chesapeake Bay watershed off of this, which is so, has a lot of longevity to it. So it's great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love the idea too. And if, if you want to connect with some folks on the COAT committee to talk about that. Maybe there could be a connecting partnership to, to launch something like that on the landscape architecture site or just some knowledge sharing uh, would be really great. Uh, one of our new research projects that we're just starting, I, I think you'll find interesting, Sarah, is uh, for that passive house project that we designed uh, in for a forest preserve just north of Chicago. It's an environmental research or um, environmental learning center. Um, we're going to do a research project with the client and with one of our, uh, with our mechanical engineer for the project. And the client has some of their staff are landscape architects. Mm -hmm. And we want to do a full embodied carbon analysis of the building and the site. And the building part, the interesting thing is we want to compare it to understand, obviously there's some really significant amounts of insulation in a passive house project, which, you know, have a larger embodied carbon impact. Uh, but similar to the envelope study I did earlier of R value versus um, global warming potential, we're really interested to see the building, but also the site impacts and, and to see where that ends up, you know, positive or negative. Right, exactly. Yeah, there's, it's so entwined. I mean, you can't, can't talk about architecture without talking about landscape and talk, can't talk about landscape without talking about the architecture. So this is really, exactly. really exciting. Yeah. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. And I, one thing that was really fascinating to me is that Lake Flato, even though it does these amazing projects that connect to the environment and amazing landscape projects, we don't have any landscape architects, but we also don't have MEP in-house like my previous firm in Minnesota did, but what that gives Lake Flato the opportunity to do is to work with the best of the best and that are that might specialize in zoos or botanical gardens. On UPenn, we're working with Beryl Happold, which is a global leading, you know, MEP firm. Um, so there's there's interesting opportunities, even though we we don't have all the the capabilities or the disciplines in house. Not that it's bad to have it in-house, but there's pros and cons 
to everything. Definitely. So there is a question in the chat from Charleston. Can you see Yeah, that? I see that. Yeah, that, that's a really great question. So basically, all of our research to date is self-funded. And that's part of the part that I lead is that um, I promote the program internally. And then once a year, um, staff have an opportunity to either by themselves or team up with a small group of people to submit for an investigation that they want to do. And then we have a selection committee that's made up of a diverse group of people within the firm. And um, the people on the committee, like uh, every year, one of those people is replaced. So it's it's a constantly evolving um, group of people. And th they have a certain bucket of hours that the firm has dedicated. And this is above and beyond other things like um, uh 1% and a pro bono type projects that, that they get to divvy up the hours for. But there are other projects, like if a project itself needs to have some research done on it, then that, that's usually mostly worked into the project budget. Um, but if it's something really interesting and the firm wants to study, then, you know, we talk about it and, you know, we don't just do it, but we need to make sure that we can justify it because there's lots of cool opportunities out there and we can't do them all, especially for a firm our size, 150 people. Um, there's firms out there, you know, really great firms like Perkins & Will, for example, they have an incredibly amazing research group and a much bigger firm to help support that, right? But good question. We don't do it really um, much with uh, R&D tax credits and that's all kind of a little precarious right now, anyways. There's another question from um, Ibram about advice tips for emerging researchers for how to structure a design build case study. Or do you recommend complexity or simplicity? Um, so let's see, the emerging researchers, the, um, we, don't, we don't do a lot of design build projects. Um, I don't know if that's specifically what you mean, but um, in terms of of doing research, obviously finding something you're passionate about is the most important thing, um, and that's what that's the kind of where the 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 nice thing about our program is is that we don't try and dictate what what staff submit. I mean, they might not always get their their projects selected and. You know, we just recently had a couple that were submitted and weren't selected. And it wasn't so much that we didn't think the firm needed to know that information. Like we did a, we did and completed a eco senior living research project and we've never done any senior living projects, but it could be something we get into and not, and that still wasn't the reason that it was picked. It was just, it was an interesting thing that was worth studying. Um, but studying something that you think is interesting. Sometimes they don't get selected because they're just too big in scope. They might have a recommendation from the selection committee to revise and resubmit, but sometimes they just don't seem like they're uh, practical com or, or as compelling as the other projects that were submitted. And Ibram, if that didn't answer your question, please let me know. You had something yeah, more. Yeah, uh, I think it. I think ultimately it did. Um, I was under the impression for some reason I came in a little late. Um, that it was design build, but I think you're answering my question by saying it starts with the design phase in the first place, researching, um, doing or as you say, the investigation on the design first. In the yep. first place, yeah, yeah. Some of, some of it will be on the design, and then some of it is is after the building is built. And um, so, like the University of Maryland project, where we studied the environmental occupant behavior of the faculty and the students, or the Confluence Park, where we're studying power after the building's done. And that's that's just amazing data to collect and and just go back and validate some of the assumptions you made 
um, we we always make sure and communicate to our clients that um, the analysis that we do can't be, you know, you're not going to take this EUI, the amount of energy a building is going to use to the bank, so to speak. Uh, even ASHRAE 90.1, which is a, one of the codes that you can use for compliance for energy uh, energy and energy modeling, it has an Appendix G that's about early energy modeling. And the very first thing it says is um, the results are not, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but basically the results are not perfect. You know, there's occupant behavior things. We can't control whether people are always going to turn off the lights or some piece of equipment when they leave for the day, right? Or uh, are they going to shut the blinds or or even open them uh, in the winter up, up north, right? Shutting the blinds and not letting that solar heat gain get in is going to require the HVAC systems to uh, provide more heat, which uses more energy. So it's um, lots of really interesting scenarios there. Right. I appreciate that, um, especially in terms of validation. I think that's what, I, what I'm getting at is uh, how are we going about validating um, and that there's there's a need to go back and validate um, these projects and, and match them with the modeling or at some yeah. degree understand their performance. And a really simple kind of fun one that you can do is if you use Climate Studio, for example, to do daylight analysis, um, it will tell you what the, the foot candle or the lux value is of a given spot at a certain distance off the floor. Um, and so you can, the light meter app on a phone is surprisingly fairly accurate, um, but you can also, you know, if you can get your hands on a light meter, you can go walk into a space on the, the day, the month the day and the time of the reading in the software and and you know assuming it's not a unusually cloudy day you can validate that reading and that's going to also be based on having plugged in the correct glass type the the visual light transmittance value so it's that, that's a pretty uh interesting one to to do that's you i really appreciate the feedback and your presentation outstanding thank you uh for coming to our university Awesome. Yeah, thanks for the great question. This is the this is fun when there's really great dialogue. Anybody else? No, this was amazing. Thank you. I was I, I didn't know anything about Lake Flato to be totally transparent. So I'm really I'm I'm so heartened to see your work. Um and I I'm not sure, did we um, assign, not assign, but a lot, a full two hours to this so that you could do a workshop? I think we talked about that. Well, we, we I double checked with Abby uh, just yesterday. We hadn't talked about it, so I wasn't prepared. Um, That's to fine. Do I mean, it. you've already given over an hour, so this is this yeah. was great. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to keep talking. And uh, yeah, I don't, just this morning in our office, talking about firm culture, uh, because we're right in the, like the end of this month, the, the annual AIA 2030 commitment reporting is due. Um, we I did a presentation last week and then another one today on early energy modeling so that uh, some of our staff who want to do it themselves, you know, this is going to be for projects that are still fairly um, early on, which means they would have started in late last year because this is reporting for all of last year's projects. Um, we're still, our design performance team will always do the work for them. But um, anyways, I was sitting right at this table here uh, in the chair on, on the right facing the group of people in the, in the room uh, doing, doing training on early energy modeling. Well, I think judging from the amount of people and students that are on this call, um, which is great to see, we probably could set up um, a workshop if not the next, like later in the semester, then definitely in the fall, because I think it's it's such a valuable um, tool for the students to learn. Well, one thing I can show quickly is an, a really amazing new up and coming tool that that Autodesk uh, acquired about a year and a half, two years ago, uh, is this Norwegian software called SpaceMaker. And they recently renamed it to Autodesk Forma. And I believe now, just recently, because most of the cloud-based tools actually aren't available to students. 
at NDSU, we were able to get a grant to, to be able to use BIM 360. Um, and then I think like the, the very next month, I remembered to mention it to Abby for the University of Minnesota and they'd already closed the window and weren't giving out any more grants. But um, this one in particular, I believe is available to um, all students now. And it's an amazing uh, tool. This is actually a project that Lake Flato is working on our urban planning studio in Austin, Texas. So all these buildings in the middle here are proposed new buildings. And um, with this software, you can do some really cool things. Uh, one of them, just thinking of a couple of landscape things, and then I'll talk about what, in fact, all of them are building and landscape, to be honest. Um, you can do wind analysis. So it, it actually uses AI for an initial analysis. And, and so the, the results that you see here, um, there's a scale or a legend across the bottom. And so any area that's light green would be comfortable to sit in that area for on average throughout the year. And then if there are any red areas, they're, and they're not, but there's some dark orange areas, they're gonna only be comfortable if you're walking. They're, they're not gonna be comfortable for standing or sitting. And so we could move the buildings around or add some breaker walls or some, some trees. You actually have to add formas trees because they're the only things that the software understand that have a, uh, I believe it's a 30% opacity. So they block some of the wind, but not all of it. Uh, but then after you've used AI to, to get most of the way there, you can click this blue button on the right and do a full CFD computational fluid dynamics is what CFD stands for, wind analysis. And it takes 30 to 90 minutes. And once you've done the analysis, you can um, pull up a previous run. So you don't have to do that, wait for that every single time. And so here's a, uh, a more formal, accurate run. And you can see there actually is some, there are some red areas. So you, you know, if we were planning on, uh, and Lake Flato does do a lot of outdoor programming, um, you know, to have a dining space here, that would not be a good spot for it, right? Uh, and then over here on the right, we can actually switch this and turn on the wind streams, which is pretty this looks pretty cool in your student portfolios. So kind of, you know, talking about the opportunity to bolster your, your portfolio and not just have a item listed on your resume that, you know, including this kind of stuff in your projects really helps. And then you can change this. So actually south is the more dominant wind direction you can tell by the wind rows. Um, so by changing that, we can see there's some, you can tell why it, it, it gets red between those two buildings, right? And this was actually a really early design. I, I saw the design recently that was presented internally to the office, and it's pretty drastically different. And so we can use this tool. This, this whole process used to be super complicated, take a lot more time and cost a significant amount of money. And if, if you have the Autodesk AEC collection, you actually have access to the software at no additional cost. Um, <clears throat> another cool one that we've been using a lot more lately is this, um, uh, let's see, which one is it? Oh, here it is, traffic noise analysis. So when you select a road, well, again, first it, it does this AI version of it. And then I'm gonna to go to a previously run simulation. And it basically takes the speed limit of the road and then the average daily traffic number, which a lot of it, it downloads from an open source thing called um, OpenStreets. But you can also look, go to like, for example, I have a video I created. Autodesk actually hired me to make some videos on this. And uh, one of them shows going to the Texas DOT website and determining in Austin, 
what the average daily traffic number is for this road. So you plug that percentage in over here in the properties when you have the road selected, you make sure the speed limit's right, and then it projects this decibel heat map onto the, the site and the building. And by the way, all of these building objects, uh, we've done this with geometry coming from SketchUp, Rhino, Revit, and the geometry can be made in Forma as well. And then all of the adjacent buildings are automatically pulled in when you select your area. So all the streets and the buildings are automatically created. And there's this little inspect tool. So I can click directly on surfaces. And then down at the bottom is this decibel scale. So we could definitely have some nice uh, uh, dining areas on the roof and, and in this little courtyard. And then on the left, there's actually an opportunity um, to try different schemes. So I just took this building and did a big sort of hack job because I, I needed to make a copy so that I could show in presentations like this that, that wouldn't be the real project or the real location, just so for confidentiality. But you can try different schemes and then even look at the existing scheme and do a wind analysis and, and see how much you're impacting like the public streets around your building, which is pretty amazing. Um, there's also things like sun hours for specific, you know, a month and day. And again, I have some, some examples here of previous runs. And you do the inspect tool again, and you can click and see that for that specific month and day, that area gets four, you know, four to five hours of sunlight. And then you spin around on the side that's brighter. You can see down here that bright yellow is, is 10. So zero hours to 10 hours. And this is December 21st, right? So this is the least amount of sunlight in the year. <clears throat> and then there's a compare tool. So if I click on this, um, I can actually compare some of these things side by side. So December, September, and June. And then they keep changing this. I'm not sure. Like they're just constantly developing this tool so fast that like this little sidebar didn't used to open up. It was automatically closed. So when you move one, they all move together. So we can do this for wind analysis and Again, we can see if we do the inspect tool six and notice how the inspect tool added itself across the entire project. Uh, can I ask a question? Nope, I'm, I have to go. I'm no, just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> please. Super quick. Uh, you said this program yeah, is totally um, it, the same question uh, Dean Asojo is asking. How do you how do we get a hold of this as a program? This is uh, super powerful. Do, you said you wrote a grant or how does it work? No, no, no. So I think I think you just go through the student portal like you'd get any Autodesk software. The the grant was just for the um, BIM three sixty, which allows you to host a Revit model in the cloud, and that's still not possible. There's no more grant, and you can't do it as a student. But this Autodesk Forma thing, if you go to um, students.autodesk.com, I think it is. and then log in as a student, you know, using your .edu email address, um, you should be able to find the download section. And, and Forma is a cloud-based tool. So also maybe you just need to log, go to, um, what is the, what is it? Um, Autodesk Forma. So app.autodeskforma.com. 
So I think if you just go to app.autodeskforma.com, oops, I had a bunch of junk on the end there. Um, I think you can just log in. And if not, I can I can work with your um, professors to try and figure out how to get access to this. Um, yeah, there was a question from Javin in the Q and A. Um, what are the challenges of using AI? I just typed it in chat as well, so you see it. Sure. It's showing in the Q and A. Uh, interestingly enough, I just sort of indirectly did a presentation on on AI for um, with one of the board of directors for the AIA. At, at last week, they had their AIA leadership conference in Washington D.C., and although I wasn't there, um, I had the opportunity to share some of the interesting things that that we're doing and. So there's a, a bunch of different types of AI that are possible. So here's an example. I made this little recording of some building code software we use called UpCodes. And so I select Minnesota and say, I want to look at the current code. And then I'm going to type into AI. Uh, this, and AI is just a small part of their software now that they've added. It's not the main thing about it but you can ask the building code questions through AI. Are vertical grab bars required in an accessible toilet room? That's what I asked here. And it gave me like multiple paragraphs and links to the sections of the code where it's required. And so since I'm originally from Minnesota and I, I happen to know that that's required, that's why I did this as an example. And now I switch it to Texas and I ask the code the same thing and they're not actually required in Texas. And interestingly enough, in the past, I've had a, a one sentence reply that said, no, they're not required. And here, I guess maybe just playing it safe now, I don't know if they've modified it, but there's a bunch of stuff about accessible grab bars and it doesn't quite answer my question. So then I ask it, uh, I'm having a conversation with the building code, but, is a vertical grab bar required? Hashtag question mark, right? And then it it thinks about it again and says, according to the Texas accessibility standards, a horizontal uh, 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 horizontal grab bar is required, but not vertical. That's what it says right there in the, the very first paragraph. Still goes on to say a bunch of other irrelevant things after telling me it's not required. That doesn't want to be seen. <laughs> yeah, but it's still really interesting and, and good to know. Um, another thing that, that we've been using AI for, getting off on a little tangent, but I'm happy to do it. Um, SketchUp uh, has a new add-in that they made called SketchUp Diffusion. And so I'm actually currently working on updating one of my books, this, this SketchUp book. You can see on the cover, it has the same um, lobby space. And um, you, you can use this SketchUp Diffusion add-in. So it's something that's inside of SketchUp. And you, you have a couple of things like don't change the geometry, or you could have it change the geometry big time if you wanted it to. But oftentimes, us architects, design, interior designers, and landscape architects don't want the thing we designed to change. And so we can tell it to not mess with the geometry, but um, you know, use the prompt influence and the override for materials to, to make bigger changes. Uh, one other tool similar to that is this tool called Veris by Evolve Labs. And so these are all really practical tools, in fact, not something that's, you know, really out there and and um, doing things that aren't really, well, they may be applicable to our industry, but they, they we don't have enough control over them to make them practical and usable for the most part. So here's one of the Revit models from one of my books. And you can use this add-in called Veris by Evolve Lab. 
and you can see the, the Revit model on the screen. And I type some prompts. And again, there's a geometry, respect the geometry, but override the heck out of materials. And you get these just incredible results. Um, again, there's still things that you might not be able to control as much, but they do have a refine tab here where you can highlight an area and say, just, just make this part different. And then here's one more quick example. So that was a wireframe view of the model. And then here's a shaded view of the model. And notice this is also an aerial view. So they actually have a special button here to be able to tell the AI that this is aerial because it, it gives it a little bit more context. And then apparently it knows about climate change because that first one was a, a flooded project, it looks like. <laughs> Not quite sure why I decided to do that. And you could see one of them had the trees super shiny right there. So in, in, a, in a super green roof. Um, another tool, uh, well, since we're talking about visualization, interestingly enough, um, I've mentioned Enscape. I mentioned that I write blog posts for it. Um, Enscape actually uses AI. So if you go to the settings in Enscape, you can see there's this NVIDIA DLSS. So deep learning super sampling. And on every NVIDIA RTX core or GPU, there's actually three cores. And one of them is called the Tensor Core. And if you've been watching the news at all, um, it's interesting. This is actually one of a Lake Flato house designed in Revit and visualized in Enscape, by the way. So um, if you watch the news at all, you'll know that N uh, NVIDIA is one of the like the third most uh, valued company in, in the world or the US after Microsoft and Apple now because all of the AI stuff out there, like OpenAI, they're, they're using NVIDIA processors for their AI processing. So Enscape, if it sees an NVIDIA RTX graphics card, it actually uses AI to upscale the, the rendering. So it can actually do a quarter less of the, it can do a quarter of the work as it used to have to do. And then it'll automatically upscale and do anti-aliasing and shadows all using AI. And so I know there's a question in the chat. I'll, I'll get to that in just a sec. Um, so open space is another interesting tool that uses AI. And we use this. This is an example of using oh. open space on our San Antonio, Texas office remodel at Lake Plato Architect. Turn off the volume in the video and just talk over it. So this was our office before the remodel. And we basically, um, using this software, you put a 360 degree camera on, on the top of your hard hat. And as often as you want, usually once a week, you walk the site and it uses AI to figure out where you've walked and try and overlap because you can't ever walk the same path twice because there's all this equipment and materials in the way. And so what it does is it, in the end, it creates a Google street view type experience in the building where you can scrub through time. So here I can see, I saw the exposed studs and then I saw the gypsum board. And then if I go further in time, I'll see, you know, I'm basically in that kitchen space that you saw the large presentations. Um, there's a toggle where you can, uh, if you've uploaded and, and aligned the Revit model, I can compare while the project's being uh, built, uh, the image on the left, to the design model on the right. So you can see those existing deep concrete beams with the holes that were already in them in the Revit model. And on the right, I can see that there are supposed to be TVs on the wall. So I could go over to the wall and look for outlets and data connections and in all this plumbing in the wall, you know, we can see that that matches where there's a sink shown in the Revit model on the right. And so how this works is really cool. Um, you put this, well, you, I'm showing the app first. So in the app, you upload the floor plans, which are just JPEG or PDF files. 
and I pick on the floor plan where I'm going to start walking from. And then it uses AI to figure out where you've walked between, in, through doors and next to walls. And there's the hard hat with the 360 degree camera running on top of my head. And so again, you can't always walk in the same spot. And even if you needed to, it'd be pretty hard to remember exactly where you walked. So the AI figures out where you've walked close to a previous spot. And then when you scrub through time, it'll jump you to the closest spot possible. And so here's a, another photograph of the space in use uh, or the finished space, which is pretty cool. And then does Autodesk Forma have flooding options? It, it does not, but interestingly enough, they're continuing to add more and more uh, functionality. And there's an architecture firm in San Francisco called EHDD, and they created a embodied carbon, like early estimator tool called Epic. Um, it, the main person who oversees that is a guy named Jack Rusk. And he and I presented at the AI national conference in Chicago in 2022. And um, three, four weeks ago now, I was actually in San Francisco and interviewed him uh, about what I'm going to tell you about is that the, the database for Epic is currently being uh, injected into Autodesk Forma. So using this um, like building massing, one of the options over on the right will be this embodied carbon tool that's using their C scale database on the back end. Um, so now we'll be able to have this like um, benchmark or baseline. EHDD is actually the architect designing or doing the remodel of the AIA national headquarters in Washington, DC. And during their interview, they showed the, the result for Epic. Like this is the, you know, the benchmark or baseline of embodied carbon for this project. And then using that again as sort of a North star throughout the entire project, at the end, they're within like 5% of that number which is really amazing. And so that functionality is coming into Forma uh, along with some other uh, functionality. And so I could see flooding or some sort of, um, you know, Esri ArcGIS module, which we, for stuff like that, um, Sarah, we actually use uh, ArcGIS Pro, the, the web version that gives us some of that interesting metrics. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I think maybe one other interesting one of the biggest challenges for architects is the um, being careful about copyright and also sharing confidential client information. Um, and so, interestingly enough. Um, well, first I'll show a result that makes it worth um, kind of using it, even though we have to be really careful. Uh, here's an actual current Lake Flato project. And on the left is a very carefully modeled Revit and Enscape rendered project. And on the right is a very carefully entered text prompt into mid journey. And it's different, but it's also, really inspirational. Like if we were to show something like this to the client, we'd have all kinds of um, sort of ex setting expectation comments to make sure that they knew that we're using it and to what extent and that this isn't really your project because we can't control it. All we're doing is typing text. It's amazing that we are getting this this close to the, to the actual design, um, and, but we're getting these beautiful live oak trees and some Lake Flato-esque pieces. And, but what I mean by being careful is that uh, most of the tools out there, whatever you enter and whatever images you upload for reference um, can become part of the, the training of the AI um, engine. And so uh, at Lake Flato, we use chat GPT for the paid version. And um, and so when you do and you're in this their team option, you can turn off uh, train 
train the model. So this workspace is private and opted out of training. So what we enter into chat GPT-4 is not uploaded um, to the cloud and shared publicly. Um, and if this isn't uh, gonna make you smile, um, it's this is a fun thing. I, I In chat GPT-4, I told it to write a draft of the Lake Flato AI policy that would protect client comfort, confidentiality, firm IP, and minimize professional risks. And it created a really great outline that we've been editing and um, about to post. Uh, so one last thing about AI is our insurance provider actually did a webinar for their customers. And most notably, they did not say, don't use AI. They did say, make sure you have an AI policy, you're training staff on it. And then they talked about the um, the general, um, um, what is it called? I'm drawing a blank, but scope of services or whatever we call it, the professional uh, standard of care. That's what it is. Um, so having a understanding the standard of care is, is important. Fascinating. Yes, we've had people jumping off. But yeah, thank you that. so much, Dan. This is great. Um, it's just amazing. Yeah. I, I was going to tell you that we have a summer camp for grades four through 12 students in June. And yeah. I think I'm, I hope you wouldn't mind presenting to them remotely because they will be excited you know, to learn about these things as well and see how in practice you're using some of these technologies. You know, I couldn't right. help but yeah. think about that as, I mean, in addition to our college students as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'm available. I'm sure I could, we could work something out. I know my- Yes, husband. I'll reach out to you and I'll- um, June ask, is pretty yeah. busy. Thank uh, you. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks everyone for all the yes, great Yes, I don't know if there are any other questions, but everyone is thanks. Yes, thanks. We have some faculty on the line too who came with their students here. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And Carlos used to be in San Antonio, so I think oh. he knows a lot of your. That's why he knows. Right? All, that's why he knows all the names that I mm -hmm. couldn't remember. Not really. I was in Texas A and M. Oh, not San. Okay, yes. No, but I, but I, uh, Hassan graduated from Texas A and M. Robin yeah. was at Catholic where I was, so it's just I'm just old. That's all. No, that's awesome. Small world. Thank you so much yeah, for right. adding those names. For I appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. We appreciate you. Yeah. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you.